Please welcome Eric Gershaw. What is this? Dr. Gershwin asked us just to give a minute because he didn't want to wear the crown. We want to make this very special for Miss Lenny. So we are making Lenny with her Texas speech Y'all are making fun of Her queen <laughs> of PBC. She has lovingly founded us. She is taking us to all <laughs> levels. And we want to please honor Queen I'm, I'm, Lenny. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> we love you. And Break now, your magic froggy, Claire. <laughs> and now... Dr. Gershwin. Now, Dr. Gershwin. Thank you all. You get older, it gets harder to walk up the stairs. I got to tell you. Oh, and I, you know what? I forgot the zapper. Do we have the zapper there for the slides, the little hand thing? So, uh, listen, it is nice to be here, and I think I've been to every conference except one, and that one I actually was sitting on an airplane on United Airlines for something like, I don't know, two and a half hours in the heat in Sacramento before they canceled the flight. Otherwise, I would have been to every meeting. Um, and yes, I have been studying PBC now since the mid-1980s, and I, I've told people that I will study it until there's a cure. Oh, sorry. I've told people I'll study PBC until we have a cure. And I still think that's true. My grants were renewed through 2018. I am over 70. But we still have, I think, the biggest lab involved in PBC research in the world. So we're hoping and we're, we're trying. Um, so it's hard to know exactly what to speak about. I often give talks without slides, and I thought about doing this without slides, but somehow everybody these days is into social networks and Facebook, and everybody want, expects to see something pictorial. So I actually have a couple of talks that I put together just for this group. The first half, I'll show you now, is going to talk about our own research on etiology, the why me. When each of you had a diagnosis, you looked at it in the mirror and you said, why me? I never even heard of PBC. And the second talk is something that is about as recent, as cutting edge as it comes. And um, I'm going to show it to you. It hasn't yet even been shown to medical scientists yet. It's going to be published in hepatology in about uh, eight weeks. There's going to be an editorial about how important it is, and I think it's probably going to be the most important event, I predict, at least in my career, in PBC. And that'll be the second half. But let's start with uh, the why me. So how is it that people get an autoimmune disease? An autoimmune disease, and there's more than 100 of them, are basically when your body attacks the immune system. And one theory about that is that there is what's called dysregulation of immunity. Essentially, if I don't turn this off, essentially what happens is, and I wonder if the lights ought to be dimmed a little bit so you can actually see the colors. Is that possible at all? Does anybody know? Oh, we got someone working on it, I guess. We'll try. But in any case, we've had this thesis in our brain. Uh, when I say we, meaning my group in Davis, California, and the people that I collaborate with in PBC throughout the world, which is now on virtually every continent except for Antarctica. And the theory goes something like this. When you have PBC, you make an autoantibody against the mitochondria called the AMA. And even if your AMA isn't positive, you have what we call T cells that react with the same antigen. We think what happens is that you're exposed somewhere during your life to a chemical in the environment, or maybe a chemical produced by bacteria, like E. coli, a, a bug that produces urinary infections. And that your body looks at that chemical and it reacts with it. 
or looks at that bug and reacts with it. But unfortunately, your own mitochondria look to your own body like the chemical, and it turns on itself. I want to explain what that means, because actually, it's become important for new treatments. And I'll ex explain that as well. Essentially, a new chemical is being invented all the time, and the vast majority of these chemicals pass through our liver. Oops. Talk about evolution. We all have an immune system to protect us from infection. Earthworms have an immune system. The immune system of an earthworm isn't really much different than the earthworm of a human. It's obviously much simpler, but the same principles are there. The immune system has to prepare itself to face the challenges of the outside world. We are exposed to bugs and germs and viruses all the time. We're also exposed to chemicals in food, chemicals in air. We're exposed to the chemicals produced by the bacteria in our own intestines. In fact, I often ask people, who owns our bodies? Do we own them, or are they owned by the bugs in our gut? Well, who wins an election? It's supposed to be the person who gets the most votes, right? Well, there are more, there are more bugs in your gut than you have cells in your body. So who owns your body? Who wins, the bugs or you? And those bugs have changed. In the last 200 years, our immune system has been swamped by new chemicals. And many of these chemicals become incorporated in our body. We call them xenobiotics. And our immune system can't adapt that fast. Over time, these are the number of chemicals we're exposed to. And I'm not just talking about chemicals that are put out as pollutants from factories. I'm talking about perfumes, hairsprays, foods, the dyes, additives. The list is almost endless. The clothes you wear, the detergents you use. The onslaught of these chemicals, in fact, is at least a component of why we see an increase in autoimmune diseases whether these chemicals are the proteins on the surface of infectious agents, or whether they're actually the chemicals you think of in a chemistry set, so to speak. <coughs> in fact, one of the hottest areas of research now is called the microbiota, in which we know that the bacteria in our gut are so important for the maintenance of health. And those bacteria have changed dramatically over the eons particularly in the last 50 years, and especially because of the overzealous use of antibiotics in our population. In virtually every study that's been done, if you give antibiotics too often and too early in life, you have a higher incidence of developing immune diseases. In the year 2000, we started to postulate the following. On the right, you'll see that sort of that chemical hanging out there. At the end of that, that chemical, that chemical is PDC, pyruvate dehydrogenase. So when you're tested for an AMA, you're actually being tested to see if your body reacts, I kind of lost the point of there, reacting with that chemical. At the end of that chemical is a, a section of it called lipoic acid. We could not live if we didn't have lipoic acid in our body. What happens is that we breathe. Our body goes through a process called oxidation. We metabolize things. And that molecule, lipoic acid, has what's called a bisulfide bond, like my two fingers. And it opens and it closes and it captures electrons. And all the cells in the body that have metabolism have that. When you have PBC, 
you actually are reacting with that opening and closing region. And so what our chemist helped us to do is we looked at the structure of that lipoic acid and we found out that we could make 200 different chemicals that looked like lipoic acid, but they weren't. They just looked three-dimensionally like lipoic acid. And I'll show you an example to explain that better. And interestingly, when we took the syrup, and I don't know how many of you, if anybody, was at the meeting we ran at the Holiday Inn in San Francisco about, I don't know, 15 years ago? Was anybody there? You probably care more about that meeting now than you care about my talk. But um, I will tell you about that meeting. We, uh, we had a group of patients who uh, came to the Holiday Inn on Van Ness in San Francisco. There were probably about uh, maybe 80 people, 90 people. And we wanted to collect blood, and the blood needed to be fresh. And fortunately, Davis is only about an hour and a half from San Francisco. So uh, we got help from a nurse at UC San Francisco and Dr. Nathan Bass, I don't know if anybody knows Dr. Bass, I think he's now retired, uh, helped us to collect the blood, and we collected it in the conference room of the Holiday Inn. And I, I guess I'm being recorded, so I better not say the, the word, but something hit the fan big time at the Holiday Inn when they saw us collecting blood and needles and syringes and all that sort of stuff. And all I can tell you is that we had the spouse of a patient with PBC who was a lawyer, and he got me out of a big jam. But be, be that as it may, uh, we took that blood back to Davis, and I'll show you what we did with it. We started to take these chemicals, and we injected them into mice. And we found that these mice, when exposed to these chemicals, made the same AMAs as the patients at the Holiday Inn in San Francisco, like all of you. <coughs> and that led to this hypothesis. And the hypothesis was that the liver developed an evolution to metabolize bananas and nuts. I mean, let's face it, 500,000 years ago, people were not using cosmetics. They didn't worry about brushing their teeth and smelling nice. And they were, but they still had a liver. But the liver didn't have to do as much as it does now. We hypothesized that because the liver was being exposed to these new chemicals, that for those with a genetic predisposition, they would react to it. And that reactivity would alter that lipoic acid region there. And that would lead to inflammation. And that's really how we got started uh, in PBC. Well, to understand that, we need to look at what's called immune tolerance. Why do you have an immune system? To protect you from the outside world and to make sure you don't react with yourself at the same time. Your bodies know it's your kidney. If you have a kidney transplant, they know it's somebody else's kidney, except if you have PBC or another autoimmune disease. What happens there is that the immune system allows cells to escape that ought to be deleted. Meaning that everyone in theory is born with the potential to get PBC. But if you don't have the genetic uh, predisposition, this happens on top. The bad cells get eliminated. If you uh, do have the genetic predisposition, they pass through. And then it only requires the signal, whatever that signal is, to escape. And one of the functions of the liver is detoxification. I mean, that's what the liver does. Um, sees the bad chemical, and it, it metabolizes it. But like anything else, if you ever took, uh, took chemistry, whether it's high school uh, chemistry or not, chemicals react with each other. Every time you eat food, there are chemical reactions which take place in your gut. And of course, the biliary circulation involves the gut. 
And there are already a number of chemicals which are shown to induce immune diseases. Exposure to mercury, at least in animals, produces systemic lupus. Exposure to vinyl chloride produces scleroderma. Silica exposure can produce RA, rheumatoid arthritis. And so there's a lot of other reasons to think that exposure to something can precipitate an autoimmune disease. <coughs> there's an example of that. It's an anesthetic called halothane. Now, I went to medical school in the 1960s. Seems like yesterday, frankly, but it was, a, it was a long time ago. And the anesthetic being used in operating rooms then was halothane. And it was considered to be a wonderful drug because it seemed to be harmless and much safer than ether. But some people developed hepatitis from it because when it got metabolized, it altered the albumin in your liver and people reacted to it and that led to a hepatitis. And they were mostly women, and they often died. The take-home message was that exposure to chemicals can start an unwanted immune reaction. Um, Tylenol, acetaminophen, is another example. I think, although I can't prove it 100%, that the metabolites of acetaminophen potentially might cause PVC and perhaps other NSAIDs as well. But it's very hard to prove that. And we're working on it. I'm going to skip some of the more technical things. The AMA test that what you see is very specific about what it sees, meaning that if it's anti-mitochondrial, it doesn't react with your big toe. It only reacts with the mitochondria. But another thing that the PBCers helped us with in our studies of identical twins many years ago, is that we can find the AMA in healthy people long before they ever get PBC, which means something incubates in your body before the clinical manifestations start. And if we had a way to find that earlier on, we might know how it started. But our immune system can get confused. And that's what Molecular mimicry means the immune system thinks it's reacting with a chemical, but it's actually reacting with PDC. That's the basis of what we and others think autoimmunity is. It's a look-alike disease. Our immune systems get confused. They look alike, like the structure on the left compared to the structure on the right. It can't separate them. On the left is lipoic acid. On the right is a chemical which is found in cosmetics. Could it be that those of you with a genetic risk get exposed to octanoic acid in your perfumes, or your nail polish, and that's how it started? Could it be that it's the E. coli, the bacteria in your gut, that also have it, that if you get a urinary infection, it reacts and it turns on itself? And that's what the word mimic means. I'm going to go a little faster because I do want to talk, uh, show you the second, second uh, series of slides. Most importantly, if we take these mimics and we immunize mice with it, the mice get PVC. And actually, that work was partially supported uh, by donations from the PVCers. And the reason that is, I can tell you, so incredibly important is 1980s when I started studying PVC. I could not get the big pharmaceutical companies even to return my phone call. They were just not interested in PBC. The market to them was too small. Because of the mouse models and all the molecular understanding now of PBC, I can tell you there's companies now all over the world that are interested in doing clinical trials. That's why I'm so hopeful that there are going to be some really exciting drugs that uh, will come about. And I'm going to skip this about cross-reactivity because I suspect that um, it's beyond what I, what I need to know. But what I'm really trying to say is sometime, somewhere, when you were young, you ingested 